Sometimes we think we're waiting on God and God's just waiting on us. How many times you heard people say, I'm just waiting on God to do something? God said, I'm waiting on you to do something because when praises go up, I don't have, to, I don't have a problem sending the blessing down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read. Until I feel like stopping. I came in here with the intent of just reading verse 13. Take it back up to verse 1, please. Um, do me a favor, just shout this. I change atmospheres. I don't accept energy in a room that isn't conducive to what I expect. See, if you become an atmosphere changer, you can get into work tomorrow and you can just change it. I mean, you going you work with negative people. They they all around you. But when you're an atmosphere changer, you walk in, there's something that happens when you walk in the room. Somebody shout, I'm a glory carrier. I'm going to shift this atmosphere. I'm going to go back up to verse 1. I'm going to read a few of those and see how you react, and then I'll figure out what I'm going to read next. All right. All right. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That ought to be enough right there. Tyrone, it is no accident that the Lord gave me the sermon that he gave me for this place today, because I promise you that if we practice what this sermon teaches today well, we could come back here in two weeks and the atmosphere would be different you, you'll see what I'm talking about finally not eventually everybody say finally, finally. <clears throat> my brother my sister whoever you are rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe beware listen beware of the dogs and beware of the evil workers listen beware of concision for verse 3 for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh Y'all got that? So he says, beware of what? Dogs, beware of evil workers. Now, you have to understand that before you get down to the verse we always, always quote, which is verse 13. But I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind me. And I reach forth unto those things which are before me. I press towards the mark. Somebody say press it. I press toward the mark for what? The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to use for a subject today, those of you all who are watching online, those of you in the room, let's just talk on this subject, arrested development. Let's talk about arrested development. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord arrested development can can I can I get you to agree that the one thing that all of us in this room and those of us who are online can I get you to agree that there is one thing that we all can do and that is to improve right is that is is that a fair assessment that all of us can improve um, uh, in spite of um, our economic power, in spite of our skin color, in spite of our background, uh, in spite of our church history, we want to all be millionaires. We want to all live in mansions. We want to all drive uh, fancy cars. We want to all fly in private planes. Some of us probably uh, haven't even been in first class, and that's okay. But the one thing you can do is improve. 
You might, you might not be able to go and buy a house cash right now, and if somebody asks you to loan them money, you might not even have it to give it. But, but I know one thing you can do. You can improve. <clears throat> and it doesn't, you don't have to improve on what she improves on, and he doesn't have to improve on what he improves upon. But the thing that you do, you can do better. Anybody just believe, just say, I can do better. I can do better. You can improve. And, it, and one of the things I teach our staff, it's not a huge leap uh, that God is looking for. He, he's looking for incremental leaps. So, so one of the things I teach them is just to, to improve 1%. Because sometimes it can be overwhelming to, to go from where you are to where you want to be in such a short amount of time. So you, you take it into bite-sized uh, increments and just say, you know what, I'm just going to get a little better today. I'm just going to get a little better. Everybody won't be famous. You know, everybody won't be a civil rights activist. Everybody, everybody won't own a business. Everybody won't own a company. Don't let anybody lie to you because all of our destinies are not the same. But whatever you do, you can do it better. Amen. Whatever you do, whatever you do, you can do it just a little bit better. So, so the problem then is not improvement. What makes it difficult is that improvement doesn't happen without a process. And the thing that gets us is the process. That, that first step to that last mile, that thing in between where you are right now, it is a monster because sometimes the task is so daunting that you don't even believe you have the skill set for it. And you look at other people and it looks easy. But let me tell you, if you were to get in your gift, it would be easy too. The reason why it's so difficult for you is because you're walking a journey that has not been assigned to you. When you find out what God created you for, tell your neighbor, it'll look easy. You, you look at a basketball player, the NBA, it looks easy for them because they're walking in their calling. But if you ask them to come into the church and be an usher, they will look out of place. Why? Because that's not their calling. And some of you all could usher. You can sing. You can, re you can record on the video. You can, you can come up here and play the instruments with them. Imagine me putting one of you on the keyboard. Right. It looked easy for Tyrone. It looked easy uh, for Nick on the, on the drums. It looked easy for Cody on the guitar. But if I were to put you up there, it would look awkward. Not because something's wrong with the instrument, but it's because you're sitting in the wrong seat. When, when you haven't put the work in, you can't expect to shine. When you haven't put the work, when you haven't just improved incrementally. They were not born maestros. They were not born knowing all of the chords and the keys. They were not born with this knowledge. But just getting better little by little put them in a position to be great. Just tell your neighbor, you just got to improve little by little. Now, now, the process, my brothers and sisters, the process is the revelation that you stuck with the process. Now, I hope I'm talking to somebody in here who will admit you haven't always finished what you started. Anybody got any half-read books on a nightstand? Any, anybody got a list of the next 20 things you're going to accomplish that you stopped checking off four years ago? Anybody got this grand idea that's still sitting in your head because it takes work to get up and make it happen? Why? It is not the potential that's the problem, it is the process. And the process, when you endure it, it is the revelation that you stuck with it even when you did not feel like it. I need somebody to help me in here today. Now, if we're honest, if we're honest, all of us fight the process. Anybody ever said, you know what, I'm going to the gym, this is going to be my year. You got an outfit in the closet right now, your whole goal is to be able to get back in it. But the problem is thinking about working out doesn't shed a pound. You got to get up, get out of the bed. If, if you got a, um, a facility in your building or at your apartment complex, you got to get dressed and walk down to it. If you got a gym membership, you got to get in the car and you got to go through traffic. It's a process. You got to go every day. And then there's another process on top of that. The diet has to match the work ethic. Are you listening to me? And, and then, and you got all of these things. I was, I got an email because you know the, the doggone internet, anytime you Google something, it's like they spying on your brain. Everything start popping up. 
And, and I start Googling stuff about working out, and then all of a sudden, when I'm on the dictionary online and when I'm on Wikipedia, all of these ads keep coming because they understand that whatever I type in, I'm interested in. Y'all going to get this in a minute. You see, what you're showing God, whatever you're thinking about, you're showing God what your interests are. And your energies go towards the things that you are interested in. And by the time you finish putting your energy into the things you're interested in, you have no energy left for the things that are interested in you. Everybody say it's a process. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, this is going to be good. I can tell right now. It's a process. The writer of this text that we're reading right now, he says, listen, he is no stranger to the policy of process. His name is Paul. Paul, ladies and gentlemen, this is the guy who wrote Philippians. This is the guy that wrote Romans. This was the guy that was in the Roman jail. You remember in Acts chapter 16 at midnight, Paul and Silas. This is the guy. He wrote, he wrote half of the New Testament. And, and, and listen, he, before he was a Christian, was a murderer. I just want you to know. I just want you to think about this because some people don't like Christians that used to be something else. <laughs> yeah, they, they, don't, they don't like preachers that used to be something else. They don't like musicians that used to be something else. But before somebody can judge you, just look at them and say, you used to be something too. Because they, they, they judging you right now and they looking at you like, like they always been holy. But just look at them and say, you ain't got to tell me. I know you used to be something. And, and if they got a strange look on their face, tell them you ain't used to be nothing. You still something. I know, I know you don't want to say nothing. You ain't even used to be it. You still it. Just look down your road because you got a whole lot of fake Christians that act like they ain't never done nothing. They want to come. Oh, you've been mighty good. Yeah, but you've been mighty bad. Come on. So, so, so Paul used to be a murderer. If you read the Bible, the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 that Paul was on his way to kill Christians, and the Bible says that he was breathing out threats and slaughter. Paul killed Christians for a living, and all of a sudden, now he's talking about he's saved. Now he shows up to the church and says, I know I killed your relatives, but hear ye the word of the Lord. Most people cannot take the right word from somebody who's done them wrong. And you will miss your blessing by not being able to accept it from somebody who did you wrong. You better hear me. Oh, I'm going to stay right there because you didn't say nothing. How many of y'all got the kind of attitude? Uh-uh, don't say nothing to me. You ain't treat me right. You didn't do me right. God sends the message through the person who caused them pain. What do you do when the person who has the word for your life in their mouth, somebody you don't want to hear from? I will. What do you do? What do you do when it is the process and the, pain, the thing that you don't want that gives you the results you desire? I promise you, your results is in the routine that you can't stand. If God didn't put the results in the routine that you couldn't stand, everybody would have results. So he smuggles the results in the thing nobody wants. So only the people who endure the process will enjoy the benefits. And when you look at somebody who's better than you, it is not because they've been more gifted than you. It's because they endured the process. Are you, are you listening to me? Literally, Paul was arrested, watch this, for preaching. He never got in trouble when he was murdering people. Go read it. He never served one day of jail time for murder, but he spent over five years in prison for preaching. See, this is, this is amazing because I would have been like, Paul, I would have been like, you know what? I should have stayed out there. But, but people don't understand that running the church don't get you out of trouble. No, sometimes running to God will get you in trouble. Sometimes running to God will put the pressure on you. Paul never served a term for murder, and now he is preaching, and he is in prison. Now it's about to make sense, and the Bible lets us know through history and study that the book of Philippians was written while Paul was in prison. He didn't write it when he was at home. He wrote it. When he was in prison, he didn't learn to press toward the mark when everything was going well. 
He learned to press toward the mark when everything was going bad. It was development that happened while he was arrested. It's about to make sense. It's, it's arrested development because some people think that, that they learn when they're free. No, you don't learn until you're arrested. You, you don't learn when it's going good. You take that for granted. You don't learn until you got shackles around your ankles. You don't learn until you got bills you can't pay. You don't learn until you got friends you thought you could trust that turned their back on you. You don't learn until you have people praying on you, and now you're just trying to pray to get out of it. You don't learn until the job moves overseas. You don't learn until you got tears streaming down your eyes. You don't learn when everything is well. You learn when death is all around you. You learn how to pray. When you need a miracle and you ain't got no money. You, you learn how to pray when you got children that you feel like strangling and you got to turn them over to the Lord. You don't learn. When you're on the mountaintop, you learn in the valley. Everybody say arrested development. The Bible records at least three times that Paul was in prison. So here we are listening to a felon preach about the word of God. And the first time he went to jail, the Bible says that he praised God. And what happened? The bars of the prison flew open. The second time we were introduced to him in prison, he was in the Roman jail. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 28, verse 16, that Paul was connected to two guards who did not know who the Lord was. Now, look at God. These guys were unsaved, connected to the man who was spreading the gospel. I just imagine this was Paul was doing because it was he was under house arrest. They were connected to him by ankle and wrist, which means, listen to this. They were so close to Paul as a prisoner that if Paul went to the restroom, they had to go with him. So if Paul decided he wanted to go to the left, they had to go left. If Paul decided he wanted to go right, they had to go right with him and they had to be in lock and step with him. But look at what happens by being connected to somebody who's connected to God. Paul is saying stuff like this. You heard about this man named Jesus? And the guard says, you know, I don't know who Jesus is. He says, listen, you, don't, you can do whatever you want. This happened while he was in the Roman jail, which is why we get Romans 10 and 9. Listen, if you just confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised his son from the dead, I'm telling you guys, you'll be saved. The men say, you don't know what you're talking about. The men get off uh, from the second shift and they go home and they tell their wife, man, I had this strange conversation. With this dude in jail today, he talking about some confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that if you're raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And the wife says, all right, whatever. She does it, then something happens to her. And then she goes to put the children in night and say, baby, y'all pray for your daddy because he up here talking about if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that and that's how the gospel got spread. The gospel got spread because Paul was put in a situation where people didn't know God and he was able to share God under arrest. You're not hearing me. What I'm trying to tell you is that when you are arrested in life, it ain't because God is trying to punish you. It's because he's trying to use your gift to change something. When you are going through something, God will place you in a situation. Listen, because there are people who need you even if you don't know you're worth needing. Paul had no idea what God was doing with him, but God took his life and he used it to shape the gospel. Paul had 30 years of ministry serving God and preaching the gospel after having spent the first half of his life killing people for a living. And then Paul goes on this missionary journey spanning over 30 years. And now it would happen that Paul is arrested. And now he says, listen, uh, I want you to know that the writers were absolutely right, that all things really do work together for the good of them that love the Lord. And it is really good that I was afflicted, that I might understand the statues of God, because if this didn't happen to Paul, Paul wouldn't be who he was. And I'm just trying to get somebody to understand that if you did not go through what you went through, you would not be who you are. If you didn't go through what you went through, you would not be who you are. Everything you will become is in everything that you endure. And when you don't become what you were created to become is because you quit what you were supposed to endure. Did you hear what I said? Every lesson you opt out of is one less gear you have in your shift. Because the lesson 
was designed to make you, not break you. And many of us fail life because we skip class. How many of y'all, in time life get tough, you opt out of class. I'm absent this year. I don't want this trouble. I don't want this heartache. I don't want this pain. And you're missing the blessing that God has for your life. Now, let me get to the sermon because I want you to understand that Paul had to go through all of this. And now the church had or has, listen, a history of believing that Christianity was or is measured by people who understand the ritualisms and ceremonies of church. There are churches all up and down Highway 6, up and down I-10, all over this city, that if you don't go in dressed a certain way, if you don't go into the church, with a, well, the church that I grew up in, women couldn't wear pants. How many of y'all grew up in churches like that? The church that I grew up in, that if you ain't had no stockings on, they thought you was working on the corner. Y'all ain't listening to me. I, I literally remember my mama going to the, to the, to the, mar- where they had the, y'all remember the Fruities and, and the Charleston Shoes? If you ain't old enough to know about that, I can't even preach to you. See, this young, y'all don't know nothing about Skittles. I'm talking about real candy. We, we was, it was a candy store right across. My mama went and bought stockings before church. And let me tell you something. When they were run, she would put some, some, some nail polish on it. Uh-huh. I knew you'd been to church with me. I knew you had gone. Because you put nail polish on to keep it from running. Now, now the cheap ones came in this plastic square with a cardboard in the middle. But they was expensive when they came in this cup. Because you know. them came from J.C. Penney's. How many of y'all remember? Okay, I knew y'all went to church. I knew it. The cheap ones were like $9.99, cent, but the good ones, they was $1.99. Women couldn't go in the pulpit. When a woman had to give an announcement, they would have. And she had to speak from the floor down here. And she would speak, or she had a little secretary desk. Y'all don't remember that. Y'all ain't been in church long enough. Y'all don't remember the announcements? Welcome to everybody. This is the Lighthouse Church. Uh, after church, we selling pecan pie for $9.99, and that'll get you two wings, green beans, and a biscuit. And that's going to benefit the Candy Striper Committee. And during the Lord's Supper, the women had to wear a napkin with a bobby pin. They don't even got bobby pins no more, do they? They do? And it'd be... There was a table right here. See, we took the communion today. Let me tell you, there are churches right now that will send us to hell for the way we took communion today. Because it had to be on the table, and the preacher had to be around it, and they had to be playing music on over there. And, And listen, our church was so ceremonial, we couldn't take the Lord's Supper at the morning service because our preacher told us, you cannot take the Lord's Supper at the morning service. That makes it the Lord's breakfast. No, y'all not, y'all no, no. This, this podium right here would have got me in trouble with my pastor because it's acrylic. And he literally told us, you can't have a sacred desk made out of acrylic. Jesus didn't die on acrylic. He died on wood. And that determined or constituted whether or not you were at a real church. Meanwhile, while we had all of these ceremonies and all of these rules, people were walking right out of the back door because somebody made us believe that you were saved because you knew hymns. That you were saved because you knew how to speak in tongues and you knew how to holy dance. But can you do me a favor and tell your neighbor, I know one hymn, it's amazing grace, but I'm still saved. I don't know how to speak in tongues, but I know when I call on the name of the Lord, something happens. I do not know how to dance, but I do know that when I lift my hands, I get a response from God. Is there anybody in here to say my skirt ain't got to be long for me to be saved? I ain't got to have a plain face for me to be saved. I came as I was.
I'm about to, I'm about to get on y'all nerve in a minute. To all you religious people who think I'm just talking crazy, I'm about to hurt your feelings and I ain't going to apologize because Paul says to all of the ritualistic people in the world who make people think that they got to have a certain skirt length in order to be saved and making people think that if they got braids in their hair that they're not saved and making people think because they have tattoos on their body that somehow they are not saved. He says, I got two words for you, dogs and evil workers. Y'all ain't here with me today. Paul says all of the ceremonious people who make people think they're not saved because they don't keep the rituals, you are a dog and an evil worker. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Paul said, I got rough language. I got rough language. For everybody who makes you feel that you got to put your finger up, you cause emo commotion and distraction by sitting up here walking. Just get up and go. They would have shut the church down if you walked across the altar. Or, or somehow you were disrespecting God because the church was praying when you showed up and you got to stay outside until we finish praying as if God can't hear when you walk. And we got all this stuff we do in the church now that we think is systematic. It ain't nothing but tradition. Carry it over. The deacons got to sit up front when the work is all around. Why they got to be up front? When we got all this stuff going on in the church, nobody knows what to do. And then, and then when people want to get connected to it, we got 12 rules. They, they got to follow, not recognizing that when Jesus died on the cross, he put an end to the law with the fulfillment of the blood of Jesus Christ saying that I have now grafted the church in from the law into what's called the grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm going to preach here today. Now, why does he call them dogs? Because I know some of you dog lovers are going to be tweeting me. I know y'all don't understand what I deal with. Dog lovers, they have a whole movement tomorrow talking about I said something about dogs. The reason why he called them dogs, look at me so I can explain to you, and once I give you the truth, you can say whatever you want. The reason why he calls them dogs is because in the East, most dogs didn't have masters. So what he says is, it's just because you go to church don't mean you know the master. That's what he meant when he called them a dog. Just because you got a long skirt on don't make you saved. Just because you got your hair adorned in the name of Jesus Christ don't make you saved. Just because you plain faced it don't make you saved. I'm saved with eyelashes. Come on, some of you women ought to be shouting right now. I'm saved with these extensions. How at your boy. I'm saved. I'm saved with this wig. I'm saved with this bald head. I'm saved. I'm sa Somebody shout, I'm saved. Now, I don't have to dress like you in order to look like. I don't have to act like you. I don't have to wave my hand when you wave your hand. I ain't got to shout and like it, but, but I do know him for myself. I remember when men used to wear hats in the church. They put them out. It was disrespecting the house of the Lord. As if the earth ain't his. We got to stop this stuff. I'm, I'm saved in jeans and a suit. I, I, I can't think that I'm more of a preacher because of what I wear. Then they would say, oh, women couldn't wear pants because the Bible says a woman shouldn't wear that which pertaineth to a man. Have you ever seen a picture of Jesus in jeans? I'm going to tell you right now, the stuff that Jesus wore look like what y'all wore. The church, the church in and of itself has made people feel uncomfortable because they don't do life like we do life. See, if you, if you look at it right now, you see this on TikTok and you got all these artists, they're, they're frustrated with the church because they got a concert on Saturday where they have to, you know, sing and service an audience. And then, then the church has something to say when they come to church. I was, I was reading something today. I'm not even going to say who it was, but it's the funniest thing. This man was cussing everybody out. He was going off about something. He said, he, da 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 because I represent the army of God. I mean, it was right in the middle. It was like, F this, this, that, 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 da 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 because I represent God. 
and Christian, Christians will think, no, you don't. But they cuss too. They just don't do it on social media. Now, y'all ain't got to say, man. Just because you don't put cuss words in your caption don't mean it ain't in your car. Don't make me come out there and fight every one of y'all. I'll fight you by myself. Just because you don't cuss in front of us don't mean that when ain't nobody looking and listening... Tell him I'm saved and I got a TikTok. Tell him I'm. <laughs> so the church judges everybody for being unrighteous, while those who do the judging are unrighteous themselves. And if it ain't one thing that get on my nerve, self-righteous people that just get in a certain environment and become a certain person. And then leave the environment and be worse than the people they judged. Jesus meets a woman at the well. You remember that? And he goes up to her and he says, uh, what's up, girl? And, and she said, what up, dude? And, and they start talking. And Jesus says, uh, you know, I, I know you. <laughs> and she's like, what you talking about? He, he, Jesus said, well... Let's just go on to get the stuff out so I can help you. you. You done been married five times. You done had five husbands. Oh, and the dude you living right with right now, you ain't even married to him, so I know you're shacking, so let's just get, get, get it on out there. And, and so church people can't follow people like that. But here Jesus is talking to this very woman. Now, what happens is, is what most religious people do when they get uncomfortable, they start changing the subject. She says, uh, Jews and Samaritans ain't supposed to be talking. She changes the subject and she starts talking about religion because when people can't live it, they talk about religion. So she goes to the religion and, and Jesus says, I ain't here to talk about all of that. I'm, I'm actually here to let you know that I'm not going to judge you like all of the other people have. I know what you've done. I know what you're doing. And you can still be saved. Are y'all not here with me today? God himself was letting us know that we are not determined to be Christians by how and where we worship. We are not Christians because we know 10 or 15 hymns and all four stanzas. We're not Christians because of the length of our skirts or how many buttons we have on our suit. We're not Christians because how we dress. We're not Christians because of how we look. We're Christians because of who we are on the inside. And Jesus Christ dies on the cross. Here it is for those of y'all who are wondering what this has to do with anything. In our series, Don't Turn Back, he gets on the cross because now the Jewish religion is trying to turn the church back to how it used to operate under the law. This is why Paul says, uh, this circumcision stuff y'all got going on, let's talk about it. Because remember in the Old Testament, circumcision was a sign of the covenant with Abraham. And the Bible says that God went to Abraham at 99 years old and told him, I want you to be circumcised and it will be a covenant between you and I or a sign of the covenant. And so now, watch this, listen to me, after he gets circumcised, what happens? It's the cutting away of the flesh. Now, finally, him and Sarah give birth to a son named Isaac, who was circumcised on the eighth day. Go to the New Testament because the Bible says that Jesus Christ, Isaac is a type of Christ, because Jesus Christ was born of Mary. And what day was he circumcised on? On the eighth day. You better hear what I'm telling you. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So what happens is, is now on the eighth day, they are circumcised because God says, I am no longer going to have you under the law. I got a new law called grace. Which is why Jesus is now circumcised on the eighth day because he represents that new law. It's called grace. And watch this. Now, if I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, then I was saved before Jesus got to Calvary. Because if I'm saved by the blood, his first time bleeding was not when he was beat on the cross. His first time bleeding was on the eighth day when he was circumcised. 
So if I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, then I was saved before he got to Calvary. I'm trying to tell somebody in here today that you were saved before you came to church. You were saved before you found out how to speak in tongues. Before the foundation of the world, God was already the lamb slain. And he had already justified, sanctified. Oh, my God. Let me, let me explain what that means then since, since you didn't respond to it. Just, just understand that I am justified by God. Justification is the process by which God, listen, makes the record in heaven look justification just as if I didn't do it. So what he does to all the people who are judging you for your sins, what they don't know is God has already justified it. Justification is when God makes himself the judge, the jury, and the prosecuting attorney, and the defense attorney. So I'm going to take Quentin, for instance, the devil says, Quentin is a sinner. God sits on the judge and says, I'll hear the case. The prosecuting attorney says, Quentin is a sinner and he deserves death, hell, and the grave. Then God comes and defends him and says, but I died on the cross for him. So then after he argues that he died on the cross for him, then the prosecutor says, but you said the wages of sin is death. But then he says, yeah, but I also said the gift of God is eternal life. Then he looks at the jury and says, jury, how do you find him? But because in the jury is the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the jury then says, we find him not guilty. And then the Father steps in the judge box and says, I declare that he is not guilty because before the foundation of the world, I'd already cleared him of his sin. So what God does to save the Christian is he operates every position where judgment can be given. So tell your neighbor, I'm saved, not because I'm good, but because he's good. Now, somebody ought to give him praise right there. So God sets the record straight on the cross, but he bled on the eighth day. And by the blood of Jesus... You and I are now saved. Now, I'm going to read something to you. For This is the religious people who have all of these rules. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 7 and 19. He says, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. He says, keeping God's commandments is what matters. People are not better than you because they know the church lingo. No, what separates us from them is keeping God's commandments. You're not, you're not saved because you got to church early and got a front seat. It's somebody in the back that's more saved than you. You know how people think that because the people down front, those the important people, it's somebody in the back that got more Holy Ghost than somebody on the stage. Paul said, you are not a Christian because you got missing skin. He says this, watch this. He says the way you know a Christian, watch this, is they worship God in spirit. There must not be no Christians in here. Let me say it again. You know a Christian because they worship God in spirit. Now let me explain it to you. As Jesus conversed with the woman at the well, as I said to you, he said to her, you got five husbands and the man that you're with is not your husband. He says, but watch this. He said, all of that might be true, but the hour is coming. This is what I wanted to say, that when real worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He says, the way I will know that I got a believer in the room is that they will give me glory. Watch this. I'm about to help you. Somebody say, rejoice in the Lord. He says, the way I will know you are a Christian You will rejoice in the Lord. The Greek word for rejoice, I'm about to shout. Watch this. It means to give God glory even if you ain't got a reason. God says, I'm tired of a church that only shout when I give you a car. I'm tired of a shirt that only shout when you get a house. I'm tired of a church that only shouts because you got a check that you weren't expecting. I'm looking for somebody to give me glory just because I said so. I'm looking for somebody to give me glory even if they don't feel like it. I'm looking for somebody to give me. Do me a favor. Look around. Look around. 
You might not be sitting next to a Christian. I just want you to look around because Christians rejoice for no reason. I didn't say clap because I didn't just, I didn't perform. I said rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. I'm going to give every real Christian about 13 seconds to think of two or three things that God has done for you and give God the glory. Pastor, I don't feel like, I don't feel like standing up. These chairs is, they too low. Do you know how low he came to get you? Do you know how far he came to get you? If he came from heaven to earth, you can stand on your feet. The mark of a true church is a church that shouts without an organ. The mark of a Christian is somebody who can shout an owl nine between the bread and the beans. Anybody ever learn to give the Lord glory no matter what state you're in? Is there, are there any real praises in here? That say, this ain't no act. I do this at work. <laughs> I, I do this in my car. I do this in the kitchen. I do this at the grocery store. I do this in the mall. He says real Christians rejoice, which means we give them glory for no reason at all. Don't tell, have y'all ever, I'm not, I'm not being facetious. Anybody ever been walking and just, I mean, it'll hit you. I'm, and and you, you don't be playing. Now, sometimes you be playing, but have you ever, just, the right song will have you in the, in the mirror. You just brushing your teeth and all of a sudden you start crying and you had to, oh Lord, because. I mean, you'll be in your car driving, and, 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 and all of a sudden, the right song will come on the radio, and the tears will start coming down your eyes, and then you'll be in there praising people behind you, blowing, and then you come out of spirit, and then you tell them what you, and then you get right back in it and go and give them glory. <laughs> he says, I'm a real Christian. Not because I understand everything about the church. I'm a real Christian because I give them glory for no reason. Like really, right now, some of y'all should about think about two or three things that God has done for you. And tear this whole mug up. Like you ought to just be thinking about, man, he did pay my bills and I didn't have a job. I did walk away from that car accident. I, I, I didn't get sick when I thought I was. I went in. They told me I was sick. I went back. They couldn't find nothing. My mama's still alive. My dad is still alive. My children are still healthy. So you got something to give them glory for. Watch this. This is Stay on your feet because I'm about to get you now. You did all that shouting. Let's see if you're a real Christian. Y'all listen to me online. He says, yeah, yeah, you do. Prove that you're a real Christian because you give me glory. But the other way you prove you're a Christian is because you have no confidence in the flesh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Come on. Come on. Don't you sit down on me. Don't you sit down on me. Romans 7 and 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no... Let me read it in the Message Bible. I got to read it in the Message Bible. Here's what it says in the Message Bible. Are you listening to me? He says... For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me sabotages my intentions, I obviously need help. Just tell your neighbor, I said, I obviously need help. See, the problem with you Christians is you think you don't need no help. You think you're better than everybody. You think everybody crazy but you. You crazy too. what Paul says. He says, I'm, I'm Christian in you. I'm showing you I'm a Christian. He says, I need help. I realize I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. In other words, I can talk to you about what you should do, but when it comes time for me to do what I'm supposed to do, oh, y'all don't want to say nothing. He said, I can win it, but I can't do it. I can tear you down because you didn't do it, but when I don't do it. He says, I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. 
I want you to go read it. I'm not making this up. This is what he, he says, I decide not to do bad, but then I go do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in action. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. If that ain't all us. Touch your name and say, he just read my resume. I want to do good, but it don't happen. I want to stop cussing, but I can't. I really don't mean to cuss them folks out, but when they say the wrong thing to me, something just happens on the inside of me. Some of y'all say, but let me tell you, you can think of some evil things to do to some people, they'll never find them. I know you out there. If God punished us outwardly for what we thought, some of y'all would just drop dead right in church right now, right on that seat. Just What would happen if I had the ability to look at you, take your thoughts out, and put the words on the screen? He said, in actuality, real Christians understand they need help. And the problem with Christians today is that we think everybody needs help except for us. And you so good at reading everybody else's mail, you forgot to open your letter. He said, I ain't got no confidence in me. That's one thing about me I got. I know I'm crazy. I just can't stand being around people who don't know they're crazy too. He says, I ain't worth a dime. He even goes further to say this. I am a sinner. And of all sinners, I am the chief. I know I got some Bible readers in here. Who in here would have a volunteer to admit that you worse than the person you're trying to correct. Come on. Come on, Come on. She said, slow down, Rev. I ain't, I ain't here for all that. Keep it down. I'm trying to help you. Paul came out and was like, look, here it is. I'm a preacher. I was a murderer. I got a word in my mouth, and I'm crazy. Christians, oh, I'm saved. Blessing, highly favored. You even got it on your voicemail. Hi, Hel Holy Ghost headquarters. Thank you for calling. And you be blessed in the name of Jesus. And then go back and listen to Chris Brown. about intentions. You got all this stuff going on. Look at all these Christians talking about God did. Did you listen to the rest of the song? Somebody say, I need help. Tell your neighbor, I know. You ain't got to tell me. I need it too. Paul literally says that I learned under the arrest that in me dwelleth no good thing. That ain't what they teach us to think about ourselves. But doesn't the Bible say it is only when we are weak? That he's made strong? Is it possible that God hasn't been able to show himself strong in your life yet? It's because you won't show yourself weak? Did you want to walk around? Because somebody taught you to be a strong black woman. Somebody taught you to be a strong man. Yes, at work, but not in his presence. Yes, in the world when you're fighting for opportunities. But when you get in the presence of God, you got to lay it all down. Bring up, y'all doing such a good job on the screen. Uh, go to um, Philippians 3 and 7 in the Message Bible. I want to read something to you guys. Philippians 3 and 7 in the Message Bible. I want y'all to look back there and see how I got to read those words. They are <laughs> the very credentials. These people are waving around as something special. He says, I'm tearing up and throwing out it out with the trash. 
He says, your good ain't nothing but trash. Along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to this. So he's basically saying these words. He's saying all of the stuff that you done built up to make yourself look good. Can you just tear it up? Throw it in the trash because the person who needs to be impressed ain't impressed. You trying to impress me, but I ain't got a heaven or hell to put you in. You trying to impress them, but they ain't got, they don't pay your bills. They don't put breath in your body. You trying to, you trying to do it for the gram, and you got a God in heaven that's actually saying, show me your weakness. Show me your vulnerability. Stop walking around here so legalistic with your chest out and your head up and your nose in the air frowning and looking down at people and show me your vulnerable side. Show me that if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't make it. Stop coming in church looking for somebody to impress you and just come in grateful. So what they didn't sing the song you like, but did he wake you up this morning? Am I helping anybody? I said, am I helping anybody? Go to verse 10. That I may know him, the power. Of his resurrection. This is the doctrine of justification. That I may know him in the power of his re resurrection. The doctrine of justification refers to God's grace in advance for sin. Did you not know that forgiveness came first, sin came second? This is why we don't worship God. We don't worship God because we think we sin and then God forgives. If you get this concept, you'll shout every Sunday. God has already forgiven. In advance of your mother ever meeting your father and you ever being born, you were already forgiven. Ain't that worth worshiping him for? After justification comes glorification. Or sanctification. Sanctification is the act of God making something holy that isn't. Which means that even though I am not holy, I am holy. Because he made me holy and set me apart. Remember, God called Noah righteous while he was drunk. Noah had got some grapes and, and got bent. And was stumbling. And then God says, Noah was a righteous man. Why? Because sanctification says that God sets me apart from people I am like because I belong to him. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm like you, but I ain't like you. I'm, I'm like you, but I ain't like you. Yeah, some things are going to happen for me that ain't going to happen for you because I'm set apart. And I ain't going to. I want Christians to stop apologizing for having favor on your life. I want you to stop apologizing because you made it through the pandemic without struggling. I want you to stop apologizing because you're healthy even though you didn't always make the right decisions. I've been set apart. Fist bump three people and say, I got favor on my life. I got favor on my life. I got favor on my life. I got the blessings of the Lord on my life. My children are blessed. My children's children will be blessed for a thousand generations. I need all of the sanctified folk to shout. You ain't sanctified because you got a skirt. You sanctify because God set you apart. Y'all know how they used to say they sanctified because of how they was dressed. No, sanctified because he set me apart. I ain't sanctified because I'm Kojic. I ain't sanctified because I'm Baptist. I ain't sanctified because I go to an Episcopal church. I'm sanctified by the blood of Jesus. After sanctification comes glorification, but glorification won't happen until he comes back. <laughs> glorification won't happen until he comes back. Do you remember, remember when, when the high priest would make the sacrifice, he had to sprinkle the blood, but he had to also take the blood behind the holies of holies and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. 
which was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So watch this. When we are glorified, it means that when Jesus comes back, he's going to take this body. And it's going to dissolve. And we're going to take off the flesh of mortality. Put on the flesh of immortality. Hear me. Which is why when we get to heaven... The things that we used to do, we won't do anymore. The things we used to say, we won't say anymore. You've heard all of that. It's because we will be regenerated. Put on the flesh of incorruptness, which means that no weapon. Are y'all listening to me? Do you know that your future is an indestructible future? That one day God is going to change this whole body. No more cancer. No more spots on your lungs. No more threats of brain tumors. You won't have to worry about diabetes. You won't have to worry about high blood pressure. You know why he's taking away all of those worries? Because the only thing he wants you to worry about is worship. And how many of you will admit... It's hard to worship when you got worries. So God says, I'm going to take all the worries. You take care of the worship. Somebody shout, glorify me. Then he finished it off by saying, I know I said a lot. I know I called you dogs and evil workers. And I know I told you what to do with your circumcision and how to get there. But then he does the most humble thing that any teacher can do. I count not myself to have apprehended this. In other words, I can preach about things I can't do. And most of us miss our blessing because we expect all of our sayers to be doers. If the person you're going to listen to has to be perfect, then rip your Bible up. Because David was a whore. Paul was a murderer. Solomon? Your little Proverbs dude? 700 wives and 300 side chicks. He had a thousand women at the same time. Not a hundred. Not 500. A stack. <laughs> oh, you, you, you like Peter because he walked on water? <laughs> Peter cursed more than anybody in the Bible. He says, I count not myself to have apprehended. I want to talk to you. Especially, listen to me, young people. You think that you have a right not to listen to your parents because you see them make mistakes? The Bible says, honor your mother and father that your days may be long. He didn't say honor of them if they are correct. He said honor them. Do you know that dishonoring your parents shortens your lifespan? Because see, kids, they get to a certain age and they rebel against you because they learn what, what, what mistakes are. Paul said, I, I didn't teach you because I could do it. I taught you so you could learn from my mistakes. So I count not myself to have apprehended this, but let me tell you what I am good at. Forgetting. I'm good at not turning back. I'm good at forgetting those things which are behind me. Listen to me. Listen to me, please. I didn't realize this until I was looking at it recently, Tim. He said, forgetting those things which are behind me. Do you know that most of us will attribute forgetting those things which are behind me to the negativity of our life? I forgot that past relationship. I forgot that divorce. I forgot that bankruptcy. 
I forgot that fight. I forgot, I forgot that. But he didn't say forget the bad things behind you. He, f- he said forgetting those things. Because there's some good things you need to stop talking about. There are some things that actually happened good to you. But if you keep talking about the time you got it right, you won't have the energy to get it right again. So some people think that they don't have to do it right tomorrow because they did it right yesterday. And that they get a pass for the rest of their life because they did something right somewhere. God said, forget it all. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. If you need God to help you with forgetting, I need every person, and if you're going to be honest, Pastor, I'm the kind of person that can't get over stuff. I need you to meet me at this altar. You're costing yourself destiny. Pastor, I, if you hurt me, I, it'd be three years before I can look at you again. Come close, don't, I don't bite. But I will slain you in the spirit. Pastor, I'm still mad at my sister. She hurt me and I just don't know how to get over it. And all I do in my life is I keep telling her, well, I'm mad at you because you did this and I'm mad at you because you did that. I'm mad at you and you should understand why I'm mad at you because you did this and you should understand why I'm mad at you. But Paul says, can you learn to just forget those things behind you? Here's when real deliverance comes. When somebody has broken you in half. Here's when real deliverance starts and you can go to them and say, It's okay because I, too, have not apprehended. We, most of us, get stuck where we were hurt, have no memory of what we did to hurting. And is it possible that what you're receiving now is what you gave out in your previous season? Paul, you went to jail for preaching But you had that time coming, boy. You should have went for murder. And sometimes we don't understand that it's a result of what we've done because sometimes the punishment comes in another form. God don't sleep. No, you didn't. You didn't do anything in this season, but you thought you were going to be able to get away with it. You didn't go to jail for murder, but you're going for preaching. If you're in this place today, your best position to be able to be free is to just say, you know what? I count not myself to have apprehended. I'm crazy. I don't know what I'm doing out here. I'm not as strong as I think I am. I'm not as good as I preach. I even try to do good, but evil is always present. And here it is. And I'm saved and I'm struggling. Who am I talking to? I speak in tongues, but I got another language I can't use. I don't just fight in the spirit. You get on my nerve in the flesh, I'll throw these hands. Any fighters at the altar? I'm praying for you too. (laughs) I'm praying for you. She said, help us. She really mean help me. I just want you to be honest with me. How many of you are like, I'm trying, but man. They won't let me be great. How many of you are the kind of person that like you at this altar right now, but if somebody say the wrong thing to you before you get out of this building, everything I preached out going right out of your head and you're going right to the flesh. Raise your hand if I'm talking to you. We're going to break that cycle. Oh, by the way, I'm preaching it. Look at me. I count not myself to have apprehended this. Because if the right person say the right thing to me, I can do the same thing you can do. From the pulpit. With the anointing on my life. That if I get into 
a situation where I got to fight, I can't wait on you to hit me first. I'm not, I'm not strong enough. I don't know what you can do. I just know what I can do. So I just got to get to my skill set first. I can't wait. I ain't learned to turn the other cheek yet. I'm praying on it. But I count not myself to have apprehended this. But let me tell you what I'm good at. I am good at forgetting those things which are behind me. I ain't got nothing else right. I can forget those things. And I can press toward the mark for the prize of the upper call. If you want the ability to make sure that the enemy is defeated, because let me tell you, he know exactly who, when, and where to get you. Let me tell you, he know. It's somebody in your life right now that they can push your button faster than anybody else can. He, and so the devil will work through them. He know you can't resist it. So we're going we're gonna to make the devil a liar today. Anybody else want to come? Anybody else want to come while we worship? You can still come while we're worshiping. Come on and lift your hands. Let's give God, let's give him the fruit of our lips. Come on, lift those hands in this place. What is he going to do? He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Everybody shout, don't turn back. Don't give up on God. Because he won't. Because he won't give up on you. He's able.
Put your instrument down. The Lord just showed me this. I don't know if it's true, false, or not. I just heard it in my head. And this ought, to, this ought to bring forth a river. The Lord showed me something as you were playing. He told me one or two things is happening. Either you're struggling to forgive somebody or somebody's struggling to forgive you. And I don't know which one it is. But there's a struggle with forgiveness somewhere in around your camp. Anybody else struggling with forgiveness? Be honest. Is this, is this accurate or not? Okay. My inclination is that somebody's struggling to forgive you, which has turned it into you now shutting yourself out from everybody and everything. And that you walk in a prism that's becoming a prison. You haven't been happy in months. You're contemplating suicide often. Your smile is not even authentic. You only smile because it's what people expect, but you are not happy inside. And God had me, I don't want, I've never called you out. You've never shared anything with me, and I do not want to embarrass you, but God told me that if you get free, listen to me, how old are you? 33. At the rate you're going, there's a heart attack waiting on you at age 54. You got to free yourself before you kill yourself. And whatever it is, whatever it is, there is nothing too hard for God. You don't have to figure this one out. You just got to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I release you in the name of Jesus. I release you in the name of Jesus. I release you in the name of Jesus. If there's somebody struggling with forgiveness, come to this altar, come to this altar, come to this altar, come to this altar. If you're struggling with forgiveness, if you're struggling with forgiveness, come to this altar. God is able to do what he said. Come right here, come here.
but he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God. He won't give up on you. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God. He won't give up on you. Say it, church. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't Sounds good, yeah, yeah. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. One more time. Everybody shout, he's able, yeah. Come on and give him praise in this place. Come on and give him glory in this place. Come on and give him glory in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Yeah. Do your work, Holy Ghost. Do your work, Holy Ghost. This is the altar of sacrifice. You will not take it back home with you. It matter. It won't even get to the car with you. It is done, says the Lord of Hosts. It is far. I don't believe He's brought me this far. Yes, God. I don't believe He's brought me this far. another way but I'm standing here on God's grace Ooh, yeah. I don't believe yeah. we're gonna stay right here in this worship God is doing something in this worship he's doing something right here in this worship he's doing something right here in this worship for those of you all who are watching online, he's doing something right here. God says, I didn't get it early, but I'm going to get it late. I'm, I'm going to get the glory. I'm going to get the praise. One way or another, I'm going to get it. He's still working. He's still working. He's still working. We're going home, but I still see tears flowing. Have your way, God. Have your way. Listen, there may be people here don't don't need this, but you do. Right now, the work of the Holy Spirit is for those of you all who do. Hallelujah. 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 Come here, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. again hallelujah hallelujah oh hallelujah oh hallelujah 
Lift your hands. Like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me, yeah, above all. Like a rose traveled on, on, on the ground, you took the fall. Hold yourself. And thought of little old me, yeah. <laughs> Above all. You took the fall. And out of all of the eight billion people in the world, and thought of me. Above all. Isn't that amazing? That he loves you that much. That he thought of you above all. <laughs> That's enough. It's just you. You, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. I know. Just for me. Listen, you give him glory for no reason. Just because he's good, sir. Not because I need something, not because I want something. He'll take it for that too, but just because he's good. Come here. Just for me. Just for me.
Okay. There is there is deliverance taking place at this altar. And ah, look at that. Look at that. The Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit is working. But this one got to come out of your belly. I speak into this atmosphere. Listen, the end of cycles. I hear the Lord saying that. Cycles are ending. I hear the end of a cycle in the atmosphere. The end of a cycle. God just broke it. He just did it for you. He just broke it. Your daughter will not endure it. He just broke it. Your son will not endure it. He just broke 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 it. Ghost, do your work in this place. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is power. Somebody shout, there is power. There is power in the name. Everybody say the prayer. There's an army, there's an army.
break every chain. God, in the name of Jesus, I pronounce the end of a cycle over the people of God in this place and watching online. I pray the end of errors and pain and strongholds, generational curses, psychological issues, anger issues, frustration, anxiety, rejection, depression, financial confidence. God, don't let us be so clear-minded that people can't even manipulate us. Ooh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Put our daughters in the ark of safety. Put our sons under your watchful eye. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm speaking against teenage pregnancy. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Woo. We're canceling car accidents. Canceling break-ins in the home. And we cancel school shootings. A thousand shall fall at our right hand, 10,000 at our side, but none shall come nigh thee. I decree and declare that you are blessed in your going and in your coming, that you are covered in your waking and in your slumber. Raises on your job. joy for the journey and God as we release these seeds today we pray that this is the beginning of more than enough that we will never have another day of lack in our life that you will add to us grace to our account that we might not only be blessed but thank you Holy Ghost that we would be a blessing God make me a giver so that I can help somebody speak against all need in your life only seed in Jesus name we pray somebody say man listen I want you to go get your gifts right now I want you to go get your gifts I want you to get ready to give if you already have it just stay at the altar with me we're gonna leave from here but I want everybody who needs to go back to your seat get your offering your tithes and offering if you're watching online till I I want to run I want to run Fill me Listen to me. Some of you, when you leave here, you're going to be drunk in the spirit. You ain't going to be able to gather yourself all day. I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me well. Over the next 24 hours, be careful who you talk to on the phone. In the next 24 hours, be careful who you go sit at a dinner table with. In the next 24 hours, be careful whose text messages you take. Listen to me and be careful whose Instagram, TikTok, social media you even go look at. Over the next 24 hours, you're going to have to purify your heart, your mind, your spirit, and your eyes because God is going to be speaking to you and you're going to have to be sober enough to hear him. 
If you're angry when he calls you, you're going to miss it. If you're defensive when he calls you, you're going to miss it. I want you to sanctify yourself. Just, te- just send out a text message to everybody who normally gets on your nerves and say, I'll get back with you on Tuesday. Something's about to happen, and I'm telling you, you better be ready. Somebody shout, I got to be ready. Somebody's about to own the house. You have not owned a house in your entire life. And you're in the midst of right now trying to figure that out. God says, I'm about to release the house. I don't even know who I'm talking to. Maybe somebody online, but God told me to tell you, you're about to open some kind of practice. Somebody's trying to open a practice. You're a therapist or something. It's in the area of psychology. God says, I'm about to give you the money to open up the practice. The address of the building is going to be 525. I don't know the street. I don't know the state. I don't even know. I don't, but the address is 525. That's how you'll know what building you should be getting the office in. Not 524, not 523. If it's anything other than that, walk away. The address is 525. The suite number is 311. It's on the third floor. The carpet is brown. But it has this, in the carpet there is this sprinkle. You'll see it. It's like an orange or a... Or, or some sort of sprinkle in the carpet. It's not straight brown. It has a speckle in it. Kind of glares and glimmers when you look at it. 525 Suite 311 brown carpet with speckles in it. That's your office. There's a chip on the bottom of the door. You'll know it's your office because there'll be a chip right. It's a wooden door. It's a chip right on the bottom of it. That's your office. You're going to make millions of dollars through that room. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. If you got your gift, stand on your feet. Those of you all online, they're getting ready to put the instructions on how you can give. Now this gift right here, This one that you've been praying over, that you've been fasting over. Somebody shout, it's about to break it. Listen, the kind of money that's getting ready to come in your direction, you've never seen before. Here's the word of the Lord. Listen to me. When you get it, do not change your living situation. God says, stay right where you are. Stay right where you are. But the money's getting ready to come in, but you can't leave yet. God says, I'm trying to discipline your habits before I move you up. It's coming. I'm telling you it's coming. Somebody shout, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. But stay right where you are for another six months. Don't move. When your lease is up, ask him what the month to month is for the next six months. It's going to be about $160 more, whoever I'm talking to. But just stay right where you are. I'm in my bag, y'all. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. Does the name 100, the number 153, does that mean anything to anybody? If you're online, 153, 153. The amount of days between your next doctor's visit. It's 153 days to your next doctor's visit for what you just went to the doctor for. In 153 days, you will be healed. from the same thing the doctor told you that you had 153 days ago. You will be healed. I just want you to put it in the comment section if I'm talking to you. And one thing I know is I'm not just thinking of this because I'll forget it by the time I get out of here. God said it in his soul. God, in the name of Jesus, these gifts that are about to be sown, 
Matter of fact, God, I, I speak the benediction over this place. We're going to bring ye the tithe to the altar. And after we bring it, God, we're going to walk with our possessions right out of that door into new levels of dimension and protection. We came here as we were, but we are not leaving here like we came. When we get home, make people shocked about the glory they see over our life. Mm. When we get to work tomorrow, let the glory fall. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Bring your tithe and offering to the altar. Put it in the basket. You are dismissed to go home. We're going to keep worshiping. God bless you. There is power. There is power. There is power. In the name of Jesus. There is power. In the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. What an amazing time we had in the service today. The word was phenomenal. Listen, if you haven't had an opportunity to join our church, the information is on the screen. We want to connect with you. Or maybe you're saying, hey, I just want to sow a seed into what they're doing right there at the Lighthouse Church. Well, listen, the information is also down on the screen. We want to help you connect to a greater mission. Listen, I want to pray with you because the word today I know it's settled in someone's spirit. It's changing your life. So come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you just for everything that was said today. God, we thank you, Lord, for all the ears and the hearts that received this word because we know that you're challenging them and transferring them and pushing them into a new dimension in you. God, we just want to ask, God, that you lift them up. Whatever the issue is in life, we pray, God, that you deal with it and work it out right now. God, we just want to say thank you. All these blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we can't wait to connect with you. Remember, share this message. Share this on, on every platform you have. Someone needs to hear this word. We love you. Can't wait to see you again. Bye-bye. What's going on, family? If you're watching this video, you've already decided that you feel my vibe. You already have decided that you like something about the Lighthouse Church. And guess what? We are looking for people to minister to who look just like you, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe he is the sustainer and creator of the world. And we use this social media internet platform to spread the gospel all across the world. And that includes coming directly into your house. Lighthouse 2.0 is simply a group of people who say, you know what? We either can't make it to the sanctuary or we don't live in the city, but we love the ministry that is coming out of that house. And guess what? We view you as one of our own. So I want you to tag, text, or tweet anybody you know that needs to hear a word from God. Share this thing so that way we can actually be in line with the Great Commission. Going ye therefore into all the world, teaching people about Jesus Christ. Lighthouse 2.0. That means that you are a part of our family and you are friends that we have never met, but soon hope we can. Oh, and by the way, can I tell you what I tell all of the people who stand in line? Give me 1% of your trust. I'll earn the other 99. Give me one year of your life and God will change it. God bless you, Lighthouse 2.0. I'll see you hopefully online or in person.